Welcome back, guys, to the Bear and Scully podcast with me, Sean Scullion, a.k.a. Scully, O'Malley, a.k.a. The Bear, Aiden, the face for radio behind the scenes, and today we are joined with <laughs> Anne Glover. Hi, hello there, boys. Anne, welcome to the show. Anne, thank you so much for coming up. Thank you. Coming up, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Very welcome. <laughs> Anne, you know, anyone that ever arrives with cake in hand <laughs> is always welcome. I got a, a mo- moaning cake. A Gro- groaning. Groaning. A groaning cake. Yeah. Well, First time I ever heard of it. Yeah. Can't wait to try it. You'll absolutely so love it. The, 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 let's get into this. The, the terminology from the groaning cake is pregnant ladies to take their mind off. Labour. Labour. Why yeah. in labour? Well, because when the, when they're in labour, you can, you, know, you don't have to lie on your back, your legs near on your labour. You can actually go about life normally. So, yeah. <laughs> so, you women, can crack a get few the cake eggs. <laughs> <laughs> you can crack a few eggs and make something nice out of it. And it's distracting. Yeah. And it's like the smells, the home, the smells of the cake in the oven and just keeping everybody lovely and calm and relaxed and normalising stuff, really. So while they're making it, they're doing plenty of groaning. Oh, that's the whole idea, yeah. That's the whole thing. That's the love, isn't it? That's the (laughs) energy. That's right. Whenever you're baking the cake and your neighbour, that's actually taking all the, any like soreness away with into the cake. Yeah, because you you can use your mind, you know. As long as I don't get a couple of contractions <laughs> later on. <I'm> gonna, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, oh, and I think that is what we're going to talk about, that uh, this big frantic idea of being in labour and, and going that. Now, some of you are going to be like, what does he know? I don't know anything, right? And I'm not going to liken it to anything because we, we can only empathise. But the whole point, I think, more when we talk about hypnobirthing and we get into it is the de-stress in the situation as instead of hyping it because I'm going to be honest right if my wife told me oh my waters are broke I'll be plenty of time I'm going to knock up a cake I'll be knocking her out the door in the car <laughs> freaking out but but it is very much uh and as we're going to talk about it about taking that initial panic and men probably amplify the situation sometimes more than 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 I don't know. Sometimes men can keep everything really calm and in perspective as well because, you know, our brains work differently. But I know with men, like, usually, generally, you want to fix it. You want to fix the situation. So that's probably, yes, let's get to hospital. But if it was a planned home birth and you were there, you were just like, okay, you'd be busy with the kids or getting the pills up and stuff, you know. So I've seen. Oh, I've right. Seen we're going to. Right. Yeah. We're, 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 I, 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 I just. <laughs> So we'll get into yeah. uh, but, but before we go all the way down that road, uh, let's get a wee bit of a background on you, Anne, where you're from, and okay. how how it came to uh, Anne. You, how many babies, first and foremost, let's deliver. How many babies have you brought into Northern Ireland? Well, I haven't brought any in except my own three, but right. I've supported women uh, through labour, and I'm actually on call now for my hundred and tenth. Now, I'm saying that and I could actually pinch myself because I never in my wildest dreams thought I would be saying things to him. Yeah, absolutely. It's crazy. And I've been doing this eight and a half years. Um, when I, well, I was going to say it later on in the podcast, but I'll say it now. Like when I did the training for this, I came away thinking I'll never be at a birth because when women are in labour, a lot of women throw up and are sick in that. And that's something I'm not very good at. I, dealing with sick, even with a cat's sick, I'm like, where are you? Come pick, pick up. You know, I don't want to do that. So I came away from my course thinking, no, I wouldn't even be a birth doula. I'll concentrate on the birth, the postnatal doula, you know, the after, but that's all lovely, newborn cuddles and all. And here I am, 110 on call. Crazy. Just Crazy. don't know where this life path takes you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, further back, before we yep. go into it, where are you from? All right, okay. How did we get into this? So, I'm Anne Glover and I live now um, at the Maze, which is between Lisbon and Moira, out in the country. And I grew up in Hillsborough um, and then we went travelling with the kids um, around the world a wee bit. And when I came back here nine years ago, this is what sort of brought me to the doula. I want to do something that I really enjoy doing, not, not a job. So, I started off in banking. <laughs> what do you think? How did you end up here? And as I said, we went travelling with the kids um, just to get away from this place. And this was in the late 80s. And um, we wanted our kids to have like a bit of a more wide open mind about what's going on, which thankfully, thank God they do now. Um, Where did you move to? Uh, we, we ended up primarily in Eastern Europe. Yeah. So travelled around a bit. Um, we went to Bavaria as well. So the kids pick 
um, German, speak a bit of Russian, speak a bit of this. We, we were a bit weird, you know, you know, whenever I would come back from holidays or to, to meet my mum and that, I'd be walking down Hillsborough and people would say, oh, hello, Han, where are you living now? And I would say, you know, Bucharest and go, why? <laughs> so because that's, that's my life at the minute. It was like that, that strange one, you know, that left and keeps popping up again. But you didn't yeah. just do the norm and head off to Melbourne or, or <laughs> off to like California or so. you, no, you, something different. Yeah, we like yeah. something different, yeah. So, yeah, we did that. Um, but strange, we went to London as well. And I have to say then in the late 80s, I felt a wee bit, you know, a bit suspicious, a wee cons- conspicuous, you know, with my accent, which was much stronger than what it is now. And it's, I think, the people thinking I'm a, a sleeper here or something. But, you know, it's life learning. It's, you know, you learn a lot and you get on with it. You make friends. And when you have kids, you always make friends. So anyway, um, started off in banking. And then when the kids were small, I did a bit of childminding, ran creches and stuff. And then thought I'll do, why not just do a degree when you're at home with three young youngsters on, you know. So I did a degree in social sciences. And it was just sort of like bringing me into this sort of um, where I am now. And how long ago was that that you done the degree? I did that about 20 years ago. And I ended up working then in social care. So worked with a lot of vulnerable people, worked with um, the homeless and worked with adults with learned disabilities. I knew I couldn't work with children, vulnerable children. I just don't have that in me. Um, another reason why I'm not like a doctor or a nurse or something. Uh, back to that sickness thing. <laughs> it's just who I am. But... All these seeds planted my mind along the way and one of them was um, my sister asked me to be her birth partner because her husband refused to go back to the second birth because <laughs> he didn't enjoy the first one. <laughs> um, and my kids were young at the time, at three at that stage, and I went with her um, when she was having her baby. And funny enough, she says, oh, Anne, I think I think baby's coming. So I got the midwife in, this was in hospital. Midwife came in and went, oh, no, you're going to be ages yet. She went out and I swear, two minutes later, my wee niece was there. <laughs> just the three of us. Uh, of course, we went and got the midwife, you know. But I thought, you know, that was just quite magical. Um, I, as I said, had three, had been through three births myself. But to actually see my sister birth and her baby was mind blown. Really was. Like, there's nothing quite like it in this world. So, again, I think that seed was sown as well. Um, about something to do, being attracted to babies and birth and just being there supporting people. And then did the social sciences, the social work. Um, again, when we were in Romania living, um, I was working or volunteering at an abandoned babies hospital, which sounds awful and it was, but was able to uh, just to get to see how things work there. I thought, you know, with my degree, I'd be able to do things. But no, you, know, you just don't do things like that, you know. So um, it was quite fascinating, really. So I said, yeah, did a bit of travelling and then came back here, I uh, said that about nine years ago, and decided at my stage in life, you know, I want to do something that I really enjoy and feel quite passionate about. Um and how did I find out about a doula? Because this word doula is a bit strange. Like when I said to my husband, I'm going to be a doula. He says, doula, I'll never work here. He says, that sounds really weird. Um, and I, he says, can you not change the name? I says, no, it's, 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 it's a name. So I came across this word doula in a magazine when we were living in Kiev at the time. And it was an English magazine. And it had this photograph of like an older woman carrying shop in this house and a young mum opened the door with a baby in her arms. And I thought, oh, that's lovely. And I read about it and I thought, Look, I'll do that whenever I'm a granny, you know. I'm still not a granny. I'm still doing, <laughs> doing this. But if any of your children need a hand out, <laughs> m- m- mummy's, mummy's a pro. They better call me first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I read that magazine, went back and found out, just did a bit of research, you know, about doulas. You know, what are they? And spoke to some friends, spoke to some... Um, midwives uh, and thought you know I'm just going to go and do the train and see where it takes me um, and meanwhile I start volunteering with Tiny Life I don't know if you know of Tiny Life here oh. it's um, a Northern Ireland charity uh, works with families who have babies like twins triplets um, multiples as they call it or families have babies that are sick you know and just need a bit of extra support so the charity really supports that and it also 
looks into why so many women here have miscarriages, which is quite interesting too. So I like the whole idea behind that, you know, their philosophy and that. So I thought I'll, I'll do a bit of volunteering, which actually, you know, I went into people's homes when they were home with the babies um, and was twins or triplets. That was just full on, if you can imagine, you know, it was just feed, wash, clean, laundry, feed, wash, clean. But just to give the parents a wee bit of relief, you know, just for a few hours, a couple of times a week. So that sort of tied in with the postnatal side of the doula work too. So that was sort of all coming together quite nicely. So then um, I got in touch with other doulas that were here whenever I did my training course. I had to go to London to do it because there's nobody here training. So I did all my coursework and come back and was all really enthusiastic um, about wanting to be a doula um, about the postnatal work and stuff. Um, and was trying to market myself and get out there and say a lot of people just have no idea. I still now, I'm like, a doula, what is that? So got in touch with other doulas. Uh, there only were a couple here at the time. Um, so made a bit of, did a bit of networking with them. And funny enough, one of them asked me to go along to a birth with her. And I thought, oh, OK. So I went to the birth and the rest is history, basically. I thought, yeah, I can do this. Yeah, this is amazing. So I do both um, birth doula work and postnatal work. And just on a side note, in case you didn't know, um, being a doula is a massive wide spectrum. So there are doulas, um, like fertility doulas, people trying to have um, children. There are abortion doulas for people who are going through abortions, um, miscarriages. There's also the birth doula. There are baby loss doulas and there are menopausal doulas. I'm not, I don't mean doulas who are going through the menopause, but to support women who are going through the menopause. And there's also end of life doulas. I don't know if you've heard of any of them before. I was not aware that there was no. so many variants. And in, in yeah. I only became aware of a doula a few years ago when my sister says to me that she was going to, she was a nanny out in, yeah. in California. And she was like, she was going to do doula. And very much like, I was like, what the hell is a doula? <laughs> And then she started telling me, and you know what, right? This is the problem here in this country. Like, this is how backward we are about this, right? And I was like, so let me get this straight. Somebody comes in, and they help you, and they help to breastfeed and all. And, and I remember at the start, and I was like, well, <laughs> if I could have got a hold of a doula <laughs> when our boy first arrived, I'd have been all over that. And I actually was like, there is a massive hole in the market in Northern Ireland for this this is like I thought this was some modern like you know the way we're like 20 years behind everything else I thought this was some like modern concept and then I realized actually this is actually a lot more well known and, and there's a lot of people but commonly I just thought Adula was if you're about to have your baby or you just had your baby you had someone yeah. there for support yeah. because years ago we, there was all big families and you would have had an older sister maybe would have mm -hmm. spoke or they'd have had an auntie come around. And I know this sounds so like Neanderthal as in the, the women came around to help. But years ago, that was more the way it was. And there was more people that there was bigger families. So more yeah. people were having children. So it was a more supported role where now if professionals have moved away from home and they maybe don't have that support network, they don't have somebody there yeah. till, till it. It actually answers so many questions. You're going to get somebody that comes in and says, no, you're not going to need to do that. No, you are going to need to do this. And you, you might be better having something there. I remember one time like seeing it was like, where, where are you going to put the bin? You need a bin beside that. Well, I'll just run. So you're going to run out 16 times while it, you, you, the baby goes 16 times in a day. And it was that understanding and somebody there to start saying these things. But... Were you nervous then when you decided that this was, and it is a modern rule for Northern Ireland, would there be a, a market there for it? And well, obviously 110 babies later, there, there, there absolutely is. Yeah. Well, at the beginning, I thought, you know, I'm going to go for it. You know, I, luckily in my stage of life, I don't have to like work full time to put bread on the table, you know, and I do f feel, you know, quite, um, it's quite an advantage for me. But um, it was interesting getting the word out, you know, um, and, and, really um, developing that role. And I can tell you now that there are about, I would say, about 15 to 20 doulas now working in Northern Ireland across the province. 
And as part of the Dilly, Dillys of NI, you can say I'm wearing my wee sweatshirt here. I don't have to tell you about that as well. But we've just done the training course here. So we are an approved training course here. And we just have really <laughs> released <laughs> 12 graduates here last week. So you're doubling up the numbers? Absolutely. And some of them have already been to births. Yeah. The only thing is there's no official statistics or anything kept here. You know, how many, you know, many doulas are going to births and how many women have doulas at births and postnatally. Because the other funny thing is, you mentioned about doulas being around for a while. Historically, they've always been doulas, but they weren't called doulas. If you, and if you see any, like, prehistoric paintings <coughs> or that, you'll see that women were being held up by women having babies. And here in Ireland, they would have been called handy women. Years ago, when you talk about villages and communities and that, there always would have been someone in the village or the community that would go to when someone was pregnant or having a baby. So I always feel that that is something, even though like the word doula might only be around 30 years, I do feel that what I'm doing has been right through our ancestors. And when I look back to like what my granny did, she was probably would have been called like a doula, you know, and all of us, you know, that would have women in the family that others would have come to. So, this how, how long do you be post and 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 pre with the the families before birth and after? Because obviously doulas not some people do go on to become the nanny because they build up a relationship and everything. Yeah. But you're you know is it twelve weeks? Is it eight weeks? Or is it just depend on the family? Or or what way does that work? It does depend on the family. Like I've had people contact me when like thirty eight weeks pregnant looking for a doula I've had people contacting me before even pregnant saying uh, when I get pregnant I want you to be my doula and then literally as soon as they pay in that stick they're on the phone uh, and log it in yeah. <laughs> 38 <laughs> weeks like, seems like you know shopping for your Christmas tree on Christmas Eve doesn't it <laughs> well, our, everybody's <laughs> at, at, different at, at, any, at any point you can blow and then you're like uh, you yeah. know uh, I've thought about this and I want you there. Yeah, every, everybody's different. And I think now, because it's such a small, like this province, it's, people talk. Yeah. So people are saying, well, I know about a doula. I had Anne. You could ask, go and see if Anne be your doula or, you know, spread the word. So a lot of people are asking. And it is very much a referral because you, need, you yeah. need the sort of like, you know, this is one of the biggest moments. And you need somebody that you, you're compatible with. You don't want somebody yeah. that you don't like standing at the business end when you know, when you're giving birth. Absolutely. And that's why we wanted to have more doulas here. I'm just laughing at the bit. <laughs> I don't know sometimes the most PC way to say things. They're starting at the business. But, <laughs> but you know what I, I mean? You you need to be comfortable with somebody. You, you're, you know, you're not your yourself and, and, and you could be in absolute amounts of pain or drugs or whatever's going on. But the but, role of a doula there, it's obviously you're there to support the, the husband, wife or, you know, Whoever it is, but yeah. what what does it all entail? Okay. Like I, I know you're saying that as an adula yeah. like, from the first initial, yeah, yeah from I, there, I'm initially like, contact what, you. But yes, what like as in a phone call, and then what happens? Yeah, so that's a really good point because people uh, another you know, there's a few myths around what doulas do, and we don't stand out there going, "I'm a doula," you know, when you're pregnant, you know, take me, take me. People contact us. <laughs> you're not at the twenty weeks, yeah, I'm standing out the front of the way for <laughs> just slipping a business card. No, nope. no. Nope. <laughs> Absolutely not. People contact us and said sometimes it's word of mouth or they do a Google search or someone said something or if you heard about a doula and they're reading books and it talks about doulas and they'll do research and it will come up and people will say, send me a message. I get a phone call. I get an email, Instagram, whatever. So I always say, look, it's really important. It's good we can chat, but we really need to meet in person because as, just as you said, like um, birth is very intimate and the way birth works and the natural process, you want somebody there who's going to make you feel relaxed, feel assured, feel that you're doing a great job. Not someone who erupts up to your birth and you're thinking, oh, it's her again. Can't stand her. Can't stand her voice. I hate the way she looks. Can't stand the smell of her, which might seem a bit harsh, but it's really, really, really important. Um, you need that connection. And again, that's why we needed more doulas, because I can't be everyone. Not everyone's cup of tea. Um, and there's only a few of us and we couldn't all have been everyone's cup of tea. We need different people for different. Everyone likes different things. Yeah. 
So it's making that connection is really, really important. So, so then you, you would prearrange. Now, you, you're a massive advocate for hypnobirthin, and, and that would yeah. be something that. But that obviously, 38 weeks is a bit late in the stage for, for, it is. for that. But if somebody said they wanted to reach out to you, um, say they're, they're, they're family plan at the minute and they're, they're trying to get pregnant and they're, they're planning the family now and they're like, you know what? I don't. My I, my mum lives across in, in and and I'm saying my mum, but I'm just saying sometimes that, and it is funny, a lot of your natural instincts sometimes kick in and things like that happen. But you, your sister or, or somebody and you you you're making them plans. Who's going to be with you? And your partner's there trying to read up and and man. But say if somebody was like, you know what, I want somebody there. Mm-hmm. We we me and my partner don't know what we're doing. We want somebody there that 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 that's going to reassure us and calm us down. Do, do they attend, do they come to you for like hypno classes before? Or how far out in, in, in the period do they do this? Well, hypnobirthing, um, I offer the full course, the hypnobirthing course, and that's like five sessions. And that usually starts around 30 to 32 weeks. If some people have done a hypnobirthing course before, we just do a refresher around 34, 35 weeks. Because for hypnobirthing, it's all about starting to listen to your scripts, um, understanding why how and why hypnobirthing works. And getting that brain to do what you wanted to do, getting the mind to work. We are not going to let you go past it that quick because <laughs> Sean and I, me I'm still sitting here with these class I'm like I'm intrigued <laughs> here. I need more answers, <laughs> Sean. Right? Because turn see, to whenever me I, and goes, see whenever I see whenever I say it, you. <laughs> no, even in all that, I'm like see whenever I ask. I want details of everything that's being step so, by step. Yeah. Walk, walk them, e- walk even, them through. even in the birth, I'm thinking about whenever my wee girl was <laughs> being born. Um, me sitting there rubbing away sand, that was my job, just to stand there. Like, I didn't know what else to do. I was like, this is what I'm meant to do. Just hold her hand, that's you, that's enough. But it's not enough. So I want you to t- tell me, so, as a doula, what, what, yeah. what is it that you're giving, you know, to the, the woman that's in labour? Right, okay. So I'll go right back to basics, to Mother Nature. Um, David Attenborough, if you ever watch any of his nature programs and you have like an animal about to birth, her cub or foal and smells danger or senses something, will actually suck that foal cub back into her and will run maybe for 24 hours before she sits down to birth that cub again. And that is because if you are surrounded by fear or worry or anxiety, you cannot birth. We're humans and we work very much the same same process. You know, we want we want to feel safe. We want somewhere where it's like not big bright lights. Like, just think how you make a baby, how you get it in is how you get it out. Yeah. I'm not saying the full works or mm-hmm. anything, but this is why you said rubbing your wife's hand is really, really important because so got you in, the bar. in the birthing process, you can rub blood with different places too. <laughs> but, you know, in the birthing process, um, there's a lot of hormones at play. It's like a, a cocktail of hormones. So the main important hormone is oxytocin. You, you probably know this because you've done having a birth, yeah? So the oxytocin is the, the, the love hormone, the shy hormone. It's the hormone I say, you are the oxytocin machines, yeah? You're really keeping the oxytocin going, whether it's rubbing your wife's hand, it's giving her a cuddle, giving her a kiss, giving her a smooch. Tweaking a nipple, whatever you do during the birthing process, that's all helping the oxytocin. Oxytocin is what makes those contractions come, makes that, makes that uterus really surge. If you get me onto the uterus, I'm going to be here the next week. It's such an <laughs> you just amazing... Threw, you just threw something <laughs> quite left field out in the middle of that conversation. And I was like, if I had <laughs> known that there's <laughs> tweaking <laughs> nipples involved, <laughs> I, my, I, I, the room would have I been doc, totally different. Slow the process down, tell you this. A twi- <laughs> my, my version of it in the room, right? I love right? the way that you just, you know, stroke her head, <laughs> tweak a nipple. What do you hear? Just what do you hear, though? Do. In the room before, you know, this all happened, I was I was like, uh, the, the best way for me to relax Tanya is by me being relaxed. So she was bouncing the wee ball. So I laid down in the bed and went for sleep. This is how, look, not a, a, I was resting my eyes. I wasn't really asleep. I was like, right, for you, you use, need to bounce the wee ball. For there, any of you that are listening right now, Anne is about to eat the microphone with Sean. <laughs> he is the exact opposite. This, this is why she has a profession because Fathers like this. I'm only joking. But I was like relaxed. But so there was the things you said. Relax. 
Yeah. Taking control back of the situation was something that I very much realized that that was very at the forefront of hypnobirthing. So just, I, I did say to you before the show, I actually did attend the hypnobirthing classes. Yeah. And as much as you think I'm an ignorant Neanderthal, I actually could, I'm not a very holistic person. So uh, for me, but my wife is, and my whole mindset in this was, even if I think this is very fair or whatever, if she thinks it's good, then it's going to be, and 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 this is actually the way, and and this is mindset and holistic. If if somebody is put at ease or something, then it's working. It's working, and I seen it firsthand work with my wife, but I didn't realize then a lot of it was round the room, and you could request things, and we we rocked up with lavender. Uh, well, I think it was lavender. Yeah, uh, we had like. And I can just remember the, the night before <laughs> my wife was like propping pillows and putting wee drops on and getting everything to the way she mm-hmm. wanted. We have this preconceived idea that it's panic, it's rush, it's chaos, it's pain, it's screaming. We well, have I didn't. This mindset. I thought it was very relaxing, actually. <laughs> oh, if you were sleeping, you know, <laughs> just rest my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bad job when your pregnant wife has to nudge you and say, do you mind if I sit down there? But... <laughs> But it, 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 going back, we were joking, and mm-hmm. I don't want to take away from the actual yeah. the actual serious scenario we we're talking about. So in, in hypnobirthing, and and for when one hundred percent, I thought like Sean, I was like, are they hypnotizing us? When I realized it was more just getting to a better state of a of a relax of a, of a calmness and and working on your breathing and trying to concentrate yeah. on something other than what yeah. entirely was going on. But the 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 premise around it. That that the smell and how people are talking and the, the even the lights you mm-hmm. can request the lights. I didn't know any of this. I was like, sometimes I, this is what I wondered. You know, it almost becomes like a conveyor belt delivery suites, and they're obviously just understaffed and trying to do what they're doing. Do sometimes does it feel like you're fighting again the current with these, and you're like, whoa, 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 we want to just do this a wee bit different than 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 you're used to, and, and do they sometimes be like, oh. Here comes a doula. You're on again. No, no, <laughs> but, but you know what I mean? Because when, when they're trying to do this and you're trying to make this experience, you, you don't care about their system. You're caring about your patient or your or your mother client, or yeah. your mm-hmm. client. But so, also you're you're not there to replace a midwife. Absolutely not. No, I'm not medically to, trained. Yeah. yeah. And I am not there to replace a midwife. And, you know, if a doula and a midwife are working alongside each other or with the doctors, that woman's going to have a really good outcome, you know, because she's got everyone on her side yeah. and, and really understand and the do process. They, do they ever have friction? What the doulas and midwives? It's a really good question because sometimes, um, I wouldn't say friction because I see my role as keeping any friction away and I would never like rock out of a birth, throw up a sleeve and say, right, we're doing this, we're doing that. There's some misunderstanding around the role of a doula and I think that's where it can lead to a wee bit of, oh, here's Anne again or here's a doula. But I honestly can say, my hand, my heart, I know, <coughs> excuse okay. me, whenever um, I rock up at some births, the midwives are going, oh, Anne, it's lovely to see you. And I know they're being genuine. Oh, because because you're, I know they're... Help. You're there to help. I, I'm there to actually help and make their lives a wee bit easier too. Um, and I can see that, how that works. And a lot of midwives do get that. So any friction or any, any like there are some myths around doulas, you know, as well, you know, that we're all like um, hippies and you know, swishing, burning sage and, you know, that we're there to take the role of a midwife to tell her what to do. We don't do any of that. Why would we? I, why would I tell anybody else what to do? My focus is on the birth of mommy and her partner and to ensure that what she wants, what's really important to her, is being listened to. Yeah. So, um, hypnobirthing works more in the, in the process of natural birth and, and, and you know, yeah. it, it's sometimes it's taken out of your control but this is more often enough for for women that have elected to have a natural birth whether it's a water birth or whether it's in in the hospital or at home but um this is something that i I wanted to say that that the reason and i was a big fan of of no birth and not a big fan but i i seen the benefits for my wife my wife's a warrior and a panicker and she would lift both Mm -hmm. things up and we went to the classes and we done on the breathing techniques and the, the mindfulness and, and, and she, she would be very open to holistic anyway in her her, mm-hmm. her work. But we went to all this 
And I remember the first time she going, you're coming with me to a hypno orphan. And I was like, <laughs> quote unquote, what the am I doing at a hypno orphan class, right? But it is very much a team effort in, in when you realize the, the what you're actually the collective goal of this is to relax, to, to concentrate on things, to work on the breathing. Because it's easier for the man to remember the pattern or the count when you're not receiving yeah. contractions and pain and, and, yeah. and, and you're you're not doing that. But the it, the birth changed for my wife. And it became an emergency section, mm-hmm. and, and uh, my son became distressed, and all of a sudden, the tempo, the mood, the whole, the whole thing changed. Even with the doctors and the way they were when they were monitoring the baby's heart, and then all of a sudden, you could just see everything became more urgent, yeah, more serious. Tragic. And at that point, like you're picking up on her, so at that point, I could see her go didn't nearly go out of it but she did stay calm and she was staying in that there and we we had we had dr stewart who was absolutely fantastic and 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 we we had both our boys with dr stewart and uh she was like right this you 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 told she told dr stewart what she wanted she wanted the natural birth where we wanted and uh she was allowed that opportunity but there was always a mind. There was. I know you're saying that. I don't mean allow that opportunity. But, but the reason I'm saying this, and, and and I mean this, I think early in our pregnancy, the doctor looked big shoulder baby, small wife. This could be. This could. This might like. This might not. And I. I think the. I think the. Maybe you. You'll think I'm completely wrong. But I think they're doing it that often. Sometimes they know when. This might not be the. This might not be the outcome, but this is what you want, and we're here, and we respect what you're doing. But I actually do. I asked her then, and she goes, "I didn't think that's a big, big baby. You have a small wife. I did think that there may be a situation where we had to do it this way, but it's still." She was like, "I never seen someone as calm." And then yeah. they were discussing the hypno work. She goes, "I never seen someone as calm, even as that it was like it was fine." And I was like, "That's not what she's normally like." <laughs> but I did, and, and even though. She didn't get to deliver the baby. I felt like it helped. Like that's what I was saying to people. If you were doing it, even if you're not sure, I still think even if it was an elected uh, section, I still yeah. think it helped in in that scenario. Absolutely, and this is the thing: hypnobirthing are skills that you learn. It's the technique that you learn um, primarily for birthing, but the skills and techniques you learn are actually for life. And I've had loads of dads said to me. I love that breathing technique. I'm going to do that the next time I stand up in front of my team on Monday morning and be doing my breathing exercise before I go in there. So you, you do learn the techniques um, and they do set you up. And see, when I did happen to birth, and I, did, I was taught to do that, what, six years ago? Dentists have never been the same for me since because I was always terrified of going to the dentist. Now I just go in and do my hypno birth and breathing and I'm not having a baby. I'm just going to the dentist and it works. It's amazing. It's mind over matter. You know, the theories that the body does what the mind wants to do. And this is all like the theories that hypnobirthing are based on. You train your mind. And exactly what your wife did whenever um, things changed. Hypnobirthing is primarily, it's built on the philosophy for instinctive birth. You know, that we know how to birth our babies and we birth, birth instinctively. But also, if babies decide that this isn't working for them or they need a little detour, that still um, the mum and the dad can stay relaxed and use all those techniques and, t- and tools you know, to maintain that because no matter what the outcome is, you know, if, if you can stay calm and relaxed, it's going to be much, much benefic- more beneficial to you. And that's the that. thing, even hypnobirthing and obviously having a doula there to help through that process. I'm assuming that a lot of mums that would come to you, you'd be like, I want a natural birth. A lot of mums maybe are, th- are that way of thinking. But it doesn't always work that way. I'm, I'm, I'm sure like over the hundred babies that's been delivered with your help, you know, there's been cesarean sections. I have, mm-hmm. indeed, and some hypnobirthing as well. But what, what the hypnobirthing parents say to me afterwards, say, Anne, I'm so glad I did that course with you because it's give, it gave us the confidence to make the right decision, the decision that was right for us at the time. And then by doing that, by having that knowledge and having the confidence to do that, that takes away any trauma. Around it, and, and also trauma is a big thing. Also, first-time parents sometimes don't have the confidence to say, "Look, 
give me a wee bit more time. Absolutely. Let me let me see. Yeah. Because sometimes and 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 I'm not saying because the care we have was absolutely excellent, but from people we've spoke to, sometimes there's other people making the decisions for them and afterwards they've regretted that they didn't speak up or they absolutely. didn't mm-hmm. uh, you know, maybe having the likes of yourself there that, that you know, they can buffer that between you know, because people are very intimidated when it's a doctor or when it's a medically trained someone yeah. and that they're like to ask for a second opinion or to ask the thing. And, and I'm not by no means recommending going again the, the, the opinion give to you. by. But sometimes it's not always right. And and people have gone on to say, no, I'm going to deliver my baby and I have went on to deliver a healthy baby. Yeah. So I suppose having that confidence with somebody there and knowledge that if they look to you and ask or, or you know, there's a second well, especially with 110 babies, it's not like you, you know. <laughs> I suppose as well, when you think there are times during the birthing process when a mum out will say, I've had enough of this, I just can't do this anymore. I just get me an aperture or just get this baby out of me. I don't care what you do, just get this baby out of me. And if you just say things like, you know, this this is transition talking. This is the period, you know, when you move from the first stage of labour into the second where everything becomes so overwhelming, where mum has maybe been having surged just maybe for hours and she's thinking, I really can't do this anymore. So what you think is you either have a safe word between the couple have a safe word and they'll say, oh, spaghetti, I'm I'm serious. I really can't do this anymore. Or you think, well, actually, this sounds like a fear transition, which means you're really close to birthing your baby. So let's get through the next couple of surges here and then see how you feel afterwards. And usually by then she's going, ah. (laughs) <laughs> and just by that wee bit of time and her just you know, being comforted and being reassured that there's nothing to panic about. She's fine and baby's fine. Just let's get through a couple more and see how you feel. And that usually does the trick, you know, and that's that's just magical. I, halfway <laughs> through, you'll be like, why the fuck did we get her in here? <laughs> <laughs> but these are all things because I meet with them beforehand um, at least a couple of times before. And we have long, in-depth discussions about what's really important for them. Because some people, it's really important that they get an epidural. Some people, it's really important that they don't go to hospital. Some people, it's really important that they have no midwives with them, that they're doing it on their own. Yeah. And some people, it's really important that they have a cesarean. There's nothing right or wrong. We're all different and we all want different things. And there's different reasons behind that. And we know at a hospital appointment, you've got 15, 10 to 15 minutes to talk to your midwife. How on earth can people relate to their midwives? What's really, really important to them or what their dreams and wishes are around this birth in 15 minutes each time? Well, um, I'm glad you actually brought that up because you, there, there is a section in your green book then where you can detail a lot of the, the what you have opted for. Yeah, your birth plan. That I was, that that you obviously in your hypno working class, you would start telling people, but that's not something you'd be made fully aware of mm-hmm. because they'd probably be like, oh, all right comes on and here comes the notes and there's going to be notes in here for this that no but you can make requests and you can Absolutely. you can detail very much what the birth is that you want to give the the you're obviously an advocate for natural birth and, and hypno birthing and for all types of births i have been the most beautiful elective cesareans there elective cesareans as well i have been to all types of births i've been to assisted births i've been to births we you know mum's had an epidural so you know in northern ireland there's two ways to birth your baby you birth it either with midwives midwife led or you birth it with obstetricians which is a medicalized way so any inductions are immediately <coughs> medicalized because there's a lot of monotrain and there's a lot of drugs involved and the majority of births are actually in the obstetric led unit now because of the the landscape maternity service at the minute, which is really appalling at the minute. But the majority of women now are having medicalised births. Yeah. So that's putting women who are wanting to birth naturally in the minority almost now. It's also all those midwives who've been trained to support midwife led births. You know, it's really tough for them as well. They're having a really hard time. Yeah. Because most of the women are going to the medicalised side which is really quite shocking because I'll tell you now, women's bodies prepare for birth from their eight years old. At eight years old, a girl's body starts to lay down fatty cells around her hips and thighs for breastfeeding and childbearing. There's 100% I'll tell you this here fact. 
fact. If it was up to us, man, there ain't going to be no babies. And I said that there. I was like, I couldn't do that. It's remark it when you watch yeah. your wife carry a baby, give birth, and and nurture the baby afterwards. It there is a different level. I actually goes to one day would tell when there were babies. I said. That wee shithead ever asked you back, I'm going to have him a dig in the mouth because the things you had to go through <laughs> to, to bring him here. But it is incredible the changes that that woman's body can go through. And, and I was like, there is a reason women have children and not us men. <laughs> but on a more serious note, when you're saying that, I, I didn't know that, that there mm-hmm. is more medically delivered babies here now in Northern Ireland. Is that, 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 that That's mad. It is mad, yeah. And it sort of gives that impression. Because how, have, how, how has evolution changed it hasn't yeah our bodies haven't changed that much even in the last 10 is this, years is this to speed up the the process and get them out or there's what? just a lot of fear there's a lot of fear around birth now um and this is something that we address in hypnobirthing classes as well as fear like fear has been around forever you know it started I like thought there years was a ago big emphasis now on breastfeeding and natural childbirth and 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 the, the releasing hormones and the the aftercare and, and the men- yeah. mental stability because <clears throat> this is one thing that I, I didn't know at the time and why why is it that one of the most not well the most natural thing in the world is to reproduce why is it that there's so little no one actually around giving birth why is it that we're it, it's almost like a taboo that we don't talk about until all of a sudden you're you're having a baby and and you're not aware of half this and you don't know any of this. It's 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 weird to me that one of the most natural things in the world you don't have a clue about until you're getting ready and you're you're starting to read or you're starting to yeah. watch. Mm-hmm. And some of the stuff that I was showing was so out of date. Like I was watching like this thing. I remember going to the hospital, you know, like the classes and there was something on the TV and it was like. Do you remember back when you were in school, they used to wheel out the TV and the, this <laughs> thing? This is what it was. It was like a 1980s production that was on. The, the And not not that the body would have changed or things would have changed. But I often wonder, why is it such a like a taboo? But I, I, I can't understand how with the mindset people have now and people are so much more read up and they, and they want to have a childbirth. But I didn't realize the importance for the hormones released in a natural birth as opposed to a section because is this is this right am i am i wrong and when the way i'm thinking this that you when you give birth you release the some of the hormones this, this thing but when you have a section you don't get the the the, the, yeah. the release of some of the hormones isn't the same yeah so when a woman gets closer to her guest date you know when the baby is due around that time her the body starts preparing for labor so there's hormones the body releases and you don't have to do anything about it. It just happens. So, for instance, the cervix, you know, the neck of the womb where the baby went in initially, where the baby's going to come out, that actually has to change to allow the baby to move through it. So, usually at the minute, the cervix is like the end of your nose. It's all like sinewy. And for it, for the, to prepare for labour, it has to go like your earlobe, all soft and pliable. You don't have to do anything about it. Mum doesn't have to do anything. It just happens. Now, what does help with that is semen, because <laughs> the same hormone is in semen that helps to um, to develop and, and uh, get you know what started the fire could get it going again. You see, yeah, there's all these basic natural things, yeah. So anyway, so this cervix uh, ripens as they call it, um, and so that's so whenever you go into labour and this amazing uterus that I was talking about earlier, which the oxytocin helps the the contractions to start. Every time you have, every time the mom has like contraction, it's actually pulling up at the muscles and around where the cervix is. So um, that process to happen, the cervix has to be ripened. So those are all hormones that do that. It's hormones that ripen the body. It's uh, hormones that get the, the oxytocin going to get the um, uterus to work. And another really mind-blowing fact, and I hope you were taught in your hypnobirthing class, it's undisturbed birth that is is going to have the best outcome. Yeah, that's why animals like to be undisturbed. That's why the cat goes into the the cupboard and closes the door or whatever and births the kittens in there. Um, Whenever uh, you go into labour... My mind is like, what what is this operation that's going on? It's like something <laughs> like E.T. opening up. <laughs> but it's amazing. I actually have it in my car. I didn't want to bring it in because it's a podcast and you can't actually see it. 
but I have a model of Beatrice mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. it working to a contraction. Well, we're 4K cameras, so you know, <laughs> yeah. you're know, having up. I should find. But so when a woman's body is producing the oxytocin f- to create the contractions, and then after the contraction, your body releases endorphins. And we all know what endorphins feels like. It's that feel-good factor, like when you have a, a kiss and a cuddle, whenever you have fun and laughter with your friends, when you orgasm, um, whenever, you know, you just have a good time, you release... Um, endorphins work out of the gym whatever whatever floats your boat yeah so the endorphins then produce um, the body's own natural pain relief yeah so you've got oxytocin endorphins the body's own natural pain relief now if that process isn't disturbed the body keeps producing the body's own natural pain relief and that is actually 200 times stronger than a shot of morphine and morphine is that the strongest known painkiller. It's from heroin as well. Yeah, it's made from heroin. So, why... W- is that women produce that? Men can't produce that level, isn't it? Isn't that correct? Women can produce a higher level of, of, of pain. Natural pain relief, yeah. Well, it all happens through, this, through the birthing process. So, if that's not disturbed, the body just goes on and do it. And that's why there are some women, believe it or not, who have said they felt no pain during labour. Having a baby. Usually because the birth is <laughs> undisturbed. Just blow my head so away. what why does that not happen today? Why is there so much fear? Why is there so much pain? Why do people say, you know, the birth is excruciatingly painful? It's because that process keeps getting disturbed, so the body doesn't get the time and space to build up its own natural pain relief. So they go into hospital and what happens? They're given the artificial form of oxytocin. They're given the, uh, the drugs then. So it's like a vicious circle. If your body's not producing this, then you need that. You, and then if, when you need that, it's stronger. So we'd have to give you a shot of something to help. So there's all this, we'll help you, we'll rescue you. And what happens that as well? We babies in the uterus, it decides when it's ready. It's developed everything. It gets ready. Let's mum's brain know, produces the hormones. Let's go. Yeah. If, Babies then are told that, oh, actually, you need to be induced. Yeah, so we have to be induced. So that process doesn't get to happen. So you get artificial oxytocin. So I have to step back a bit. So when the body produces its own oxytocin, it's coming from the brain. Yeah, if the body produces it. When you go into hospital or induced, the artificial oxytocin goes into the vein, goes straight to the uterus. So there's no production then of the body's own natural pain relief. That whole process, the natural process doesn't happen. It's medicalized now. So the artificial oxytocin goes straight to the uterus to make it contract. And what happens then? We baby's like, I'm quite happy in here. What's going on? Oh, someone's trying to get me out. They might be quite happy and think, well, I actually, okay, I'm ready. Or they might think, I'm not actually ready yet. So what happens? They get all distressed. And then we know what that leads to. Mm-hmm means they get got, me out of here. They got their fucking eviction notice. Yeah. yeah. Well, so that's the difference between a natural birth and in a very, very, very short nutshell. No, but, but it makes total uh, sense. So, like, uh, if you're, if you're, mm-hmm. if your body is telling you that you need the natural pain relief, that your brain's sending them signals, but if you override that, it's not going to make it. Yeah. So, so it makes total sense. And yeah. is that why a lot are going more the medical side than the natural birthing side is that is that why that's happening or the medication the reason why there's an, why more women are birthing medically is because a lot of them are being induced so mm-hmm. that immediately is the medicalized birth yeah so the rate of induction is sky high do you, do you so, ever attend and be like why are they racing to in, induce i well this is something i talked to my clients beforehand so they're well prepared yeah there's lots of reasons to be induced. Um, baby's too big, baby's too small, too much amniotic fluid, too little amniotic fluid. Past your guest date. I say guest date because there's a complete guest plucked out of the sky, basically. I know that's exaggeration, but we're not robots. All our bodies are different. So do you know that the guest date, the date that they give you for your baby, is usually based around um, a formula invented by a man in the 17th century? that um, every woman um, menstruates every 28 days and on the 14th day she ovulates and conceives the baby. So that is the information that that really is based on, that guest date. 
There's different, a few other different formulas, but it really comes down to that. And then there's a dating scan, which is usually is not 100% accurate. And that's on head size then, right? Yeah, is there anything? I, I mean, whenever we were, they were they were taking the size of the head and they were saying, yeah, you're on track or whatever it was, how many weeks that you're on. Yeah. But there was also, because we went privately, the, the same doctor was measuring the same each time. Yeah. Where a few of our other friends, they were getting different dates and whatever it was because... Not everybody's going to measure the same way exactly. on, on the size of the head. Yeah. So that was throwing things off as well. Yeah, and that leads into continu continuity of care, which you were paying for, mm -hmm. to have the same person. Um, and I must say that here in, here in Northern Ireland, we're sort of leading the UK at the minute with a rollout of continuity of care, maternity model of care, which means every woman should have the same midwife, which is really really important but of course it's only happened very very small pockets at the moment every trust has a quantity of care team but they're and some of them are, are like hitting the floor running you know they're hundreds of births but again it's down to resources and staffing but that's like a detour but it is you have to i do have to mention that because it's amazing and it was something we should be proud of here but still not taken away from all those horrible statistics that we have at the minute Northern Ireland has the highest rate of induction in the UK, has the highest rate of cesarean in the UK, and unfortunately has the highest rate of stillbirth. Yeah. Which is shocking. I am. Um, your jaws are touching <laughs> your chin. Aye, because yeah. there's no, look, uh, you know, we, and, uh, and nearly it wasn't nice to do it on both sides, to, to how well the blood, and then to turn around and say them statistics are shocking, that there's no... I, I'm sure somebody can try and quantify that, but the fact that that we're the highest, that, that what's the reason into that? They're not different babies. We're not. We're not a different. We're not a different uh, ethnic race or or whatever. The, so the bodies won't be different. So there there has to be a reason for that, and it seems more like. Uh, a see it seems more like the uh, the mindset. And the, the operating procedure seems to be that if that's the case, then th that needs addressed the whole from the bottom up to that. Um, I, I also went private and I have to say it was the best money I ever spent because there's very rare situations where finance can improve your health. Mm hmm. The care and the attention to detail that Dr. Sir and her team give to my wife. And we had, Danielle got really ill in her thyroid, went hyperthyroid and her heart rate went to like 160 for like two or three days. And, you know, when everything's fine, everyone's great mm -hmm. and everything's fine. It's when things aren't right is when you want to know that you have the right people there. And that's how I... I Fortunately, I found out we did because all the right decisions were made at the right time and I had two healthy boys and, and thank God. But it's nearly not fair in the fact that there's people there that probably if they had them people and they had people at the right period of time, the baby would still be here or, or, or situations would have better outcomes and stuff like that. So to hear that statistic, it's, it's not nice. To hear the fact that, that we're, we're, they're doing so well in other areas is is promising and like you've hear so many positive feedbacks and and, and mm -hmm. things and i always hate that if we're here bashing the nhs or bashing people that's trying to do their best you know or bashing doctor or police or, or people that are all trying to do their best in situations but it, it at the end of the day the national health service is overstretched underfunded and overused and and like you see it then people are working ridiculous hours and it becomes a conveyor belt and we only ever seem to pull it up when something goes wrong. Yeah, well, the system can't, it can't hold out. You know, if you think if I give it like if you look at it this way, if a woman goes into labour naturally and goes into hospital to have her baby, she'll have like two midwives, one for her and one for the baby. And if, if this all happens pretty quickly, that's maybe all that she will see, you know, a couple of midwives. If you go in for an induction you're talking tens of midwives and doctors. If you end up in theatre, you're talking about teams of people around you. So it's almost like a vicious circle. We are creating more and more of this. Are they, isn't there, but is there not, is there not some of the maternity wards, uh, maternity wards becoming more, there's a midlife with, uh, led sections in them. And is, is that not right? Is that not something that they've 
started doing that that I hear in, in, in Craig Avon they have a new midwifery led unit is that not right though? yeah it is so there is a midwifery led unit in Craig Avon it's been there for a long time so Northern Ireland the maternity service have been changing so since COVID um they closed down the standalone midwife led unit in Belfast at the Mater Hospital because Mater Hospital became the COVID hospital then there was an incident in Lagan Valley. Um, unfortunately, a wee baby died, and the coroner um, asked the Department of Health then so to with, withdraw the guidelines for um, women being able to go into standalone midwife-led units. So Lagan Valley was closed down, and Down Patrick was closed down. So there's no standalone birth centres or midwife-led units in Northern Ireland. There are alongside midwife-led units, so there's, there's one in the Royal, there's one all, all around the province, but sometimes there's no staff for them and they're, they're closed at short notice. So it's back to women's choices. So just a couple of things that we mentioned before. You mentioned allowed, people not being allowed. I hate that because I have to say, when it comes to maternity choices and maternity law, do you know that no one can lay a finger on a woman's body when she's pregnant or in labour or during birth unless she gives them consent. Now to get consent that woman is supposed to be told what is happening to her, what the options are, what the alternatives are, what the benefits are, what the risks are um, before that any any procedure can go ahead Yeah, so that she can give informed consent. Yeah. Um, but going in for an induction, if someone's going for induction, they're supposed to be told, like, what are the benefits of this induction? What are the risks to you? What are the risks to your baby? Because induction is not a risk-free procedure. What are the alternatives here? What does your instinct tell you? What does your intuition say? Like, we want you to have an induction because you're 41 weeks. Is that a good enough reason, like, for induction? Is baby okay? Is there other ways that we can monitor baby? Um, are you doing okay? If you're fit and healthy and baby's fit and healthy... Is it a good enough reason for an induction? So why do we do nothing? Just leave it. Just leave it for a day. Leave it for a couple of days. So I'm going through this acronym called the BRAIN. You've probably heard it before. Use your brain. Always ask. It's not even just for birth. It's like before you buy that new car, before you buy those new shoes, think what are the benefits? What are the risks? What's the alternative? What's your instinct telling you? What if you do nothing? And you can add an S on the end for if you're in hospital and someone saying you need to do this just smile at them or you can ask for a second opinion or you can ask for a bit of space you can just give us a wee bit of space here just give us 10 minutes to we talk us through and see then where we go from there so if people have a time or know that they can do this then they still keep in control of the situation and don't feel then that things weren't taken out of their hands so there's none of this allowing you to do this or letting you they wouldn't let me do this they wouldn't let me do that come on you're a grown woman you can, you've got a really good professional job. Why are you saying someone won't let you do this? This is your body and your baby. No one can do anything to your body or your baby without your consent. And did you know that babies have no rights until they take the first breath of air? So playing this dead baby card shouldn't actually work. This is a big statement. That, but, um, yeah. It, it, it oh, I just, but I know what you're saying, and, and and I know for the fact that you're you're saying it, and it uh, to me, yeah, you're absolutely correct. But also, you you when to be fair to some of the mothers there that say, oh, I didn't have, they're the most vulnerable. They're maybe not fully aware of of what's being said. If if that was a contract in any law, it would never stand up because it's under duress and it's under things. So quantifying conversations is had with you about risks and and thing is very hard if you're in distress your baby's in distress or or thing and also t- yeah that's what's supposed to happen but sometimes if, if doctors have to start acting quick i would rather they just done what they needed to do if it was if it was to save absolutely baby, mother yeah. whatever it yeah. is then mm-hmm. stand and having a, a five minute brief of of the the thing but i, I completely understand what you're saying that if you're <coughs> of clear mind and judgment and you do not feel something's right you should 100 percent stand up and not be afraid it's not as easy as that it's an intimidating environment if you feel someone 
automatically as a doctor. And we've had this in different scenarios, not birth. We've had this in, in uh, a lady here that had breast cancer and had to get a mm-hmm. second opinion and was right to do so. It mm-hmm. saved her life. Mm-hmm. You, you, you're entitled, but we assume these people know best. And who are we to question this? And we're just annoying and we're just thing when really you shouldn't care and give a shit because I, I, I know 100%. I know my, I actually t- go as far to tell you a situation that happened to me and I and, and I didn't really want to go into this, but this is something that I find in this country that, that, that when you get private care, you still end up in the same labour unit. Mm-hmm. Which, hospital, which shouldn't yeah. be the situation because it's not fair. Because I'll tell you why, when it was in, in the situation of my second child, uh, the the consultant that was in on call at the time, the there was a baby delivered uh, that night in a, in a section and we were told to come back the next day. It was a planned section. Uh, there was an emergency that night, so then it had cleared and our consultant wasn't due to come down because they had uh, um, appointments that morning. So they come round and goes, we're going to take you in now, and such and such is going to do it. And I goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. I could see, instantly see my wife starting to panic because this wasn't the person she had known for the last three years and that had delivered our previous mm. child and someone that we talked to and discussed our plans and knew what we wanted. And yeah. this was some other uh, doctor, which I am sure... Is probably every bit as well trained, and and uh, and as I, I could see her just instantly change in her her whole demeanor. She just started panicking. Of I'm going in here an operation with somebody I don't know. And I had to be a dick, in the middle of the thing. Goes no, we'll wait. So all these people that are overstaffed and waiting to go off to another unit because they obviously wanted to carry out that section so they could go on. I had to stand and say, no, we'll wait. But that's the right thing to do for you and, and your wife, wasn't it? And you shouldn't feel that you know that you, that was well, wrong. Well, it was a, uh, maybe my attitude then because the 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 midwife that came in to say it to me was not pleased, and she was then trying to talk to Danielle while I was there, and I was like, "You don't need to talk like I'm not here. I'm telling you the the, the wishes we had and we've talked about." Mm-hmm. So. I actually was standing there and she was vulnerable and she was like, you know what, maybe. And I was like, no, we'll wait and we will wait. And I was like, I know from my actions that I made other people wait to get medical attention later that day because I was being selfish as in I'll look after my wife and I'll look after my child and I don't give a fuck about who or what or where you need to go on till. We're going to wait. And we did wait. And I, And all of a sudden, like, I knew they were outside and they're going back and forth and they're waiting and they're thinking, this dick in here is digging his heels in, right? And afterwards then, when my baby's there and everything was grand, I was happy. I went in and I said, look, I brought stuff down later on that evening for him. I said, look, I'm sorry. It's not my fault either that this this works this way. It shouldn't be the way. It mm-hmm. should be that if you're private, you're private. And that that overlapped and it affected other people. And and I didn't think that was a fair process. I didn't think it was fair that I had to end up doing that. It wasn't fair on the doctor that was trying to obviously clear the schedule. It wasn't fair on my consultant either. They had they, they had their plan they had their practice and they had their but that did happen. Yeah. But my wife would have went along with that. And like she she's a clever woman and, and in a normal time she would have said no, but in that vulnerable state, she would have agreed to something that she wouldn't normally. So when we're talking about making that, sometimes they would agree to things that in a normal, Absolutely. rationalized yeah. mind, they wouldn't. So having somebody there like yourself to maybe to give that confidence in there and say, you know, you don't have to do this. You don't have to just yeah. go along with this. We can turn around and say, well, head. yeah. And it's just reminding them, is this actually what you really want to do? Because I know as a doula, I don't want my clans come back and say to me, and you never told me that I could have waited five minutes you didn't tell me that I could have waited for my own consultant to come in later why did you not remind us then <laughs> so it's just I always have to be quite like thinking on my feet a lot as well and making sure I'm covering all angles too and I'm sure not pushing me for. your idea to them either I can't I you know that's why I have to remain professional that's why I do my training and that's why I keep up you know my professionalism as well because it's not about me you know it's all about that mummy and the daddy are a partner and the baby, you know, and 
we know, like we said earlier, birth affects everybody. It affects all of us because we're all born. We usually are supporting someone at, at labour, birth at some stage, whether you're a man or a woman, you know. So this is why people can't turn or walk away from it and say, it's got nothing to do with me, birth, you know, or it's a woman's business. Birth isn't always, a wo- okay, women actually birth the babies, but men are an integral part in this as well, and they should be included and they should be involved in decision-making as well. So see, after the whole birthing process, like you're obviously there to support. Mm-hmm. So what's the support after then? You know, uh, they obviously go home. Do you, do you support them through, you know, all the things, get you home and go through that whole process? So what what's the role mm-hmm. of a, a doula afterwards? Okay, so if I quickly run through like what a birth doula does. So mm-hmm. the birth doula is like um, preparing a couple for, for birth. We also talk about the postnatal period because I've had couples before say, see the birth on? It was a doddle. It was that six weeks after. It was really, really hard work. So we talk about the postnatal stage as well. So we talk about things like birth plans, birth choices. We talk about uh, comfort measures. And then we talk about what do you need then when the baby comes along? What's really important? Like you've both been through it. You know that postnatal stage with the first baby. It's like your head somewhere else. It's like sleep deprivation. You can't think straight. It's a form of torture. <laughs> you do anything just to sleep. And, for, and you're also concerned about the baby getting enough food and being fed and all. And you think about the mum. If you think a baby's needs are being fed, being kept clean, being loved, and the mummy's the same. She might want a few bit extra than that, but it's the same sort of thing. So as a postnatal doula, it's like trying to keep that as smooth as possible. Going in, maybe the mum and dad just want a, a nap, some sleep, but they want to know that the baby's going to be okay while they take a nap, or they might want me just to take the baby out for a walk. The mum might want someone to sit with her while she's doing the feeding, whether it's bottle feeding or or um, breastfeeding. Uh, we do have extra training, obviously, to support all types of feeding. Um, we don't, obviously, breast is best, but we believe fed is best. Yeah. So there's a lot of um, questions about how often the baby should be fed. And again, midwives are still calling. That's their role as well. Midwives are calling in to see mum and baby, that mummy's healing well. Um, so with the, the doula, it's more on the practical and emotional side of things. So I'm making sure... That her bed's lovely and clean and cosy the way she wants it. That there's food in the cupboards. That there's maybe some food in the stove or something ready there to eat uh, and to drink. Um, the laundry's up to date. Maybe run the hoover around. Or maybe she just wants me to actually just lie down in the bed beside her. Just comfort her. She maybe wants to debrief the birth. Like what actually happened there? How did that happen? Why did that happen? Um, and then it's also like just um, any things to really help. Uh, with the healing process. No matter how the baby's born, whether the baby comes out of the vagina or baby comes out of the belly, um, there's a lot of healing going on. A lot of healing. Um, the body is in repair mode. So it's looking at, will a nice groaning cake help with this? You know, will, that, will the, all those properties the groaning cake have help with the healing process? Making sure mum has lots of, you know, good water, you know, nice lovely water fluids to drink as her body is uh, getting back to normal. Maybe she likes some the lavender still comes out, hypnobirthing techniques still come out, um, especially for sleep um, and rest. Uh, what else? What's those wee things in the baby's nappy? You know, things that maybe someone's never told her about. Is it day five, we see like wee tomato seeds and the wee mustard seeds in the baby's nappy. That's okay, that's just the baby's brown fat that the baby had before it was born, doesn't need it anymore because it's getting milk. Nothing to worry about. Why does baby have all the hiccups? How do I cut my baby's nails? All these little things that can really put mum and dad into anxiety. It's a bit just like having someone there who isn't coming in saying, what did you wake the baby for? You should let him sleep. Why did you put the baby down like this to sleep? What, how are you holding that baby? Is that right? Watch the baby's neck. No, it's not someone coming in criticising or telling them what to do. Again, we're, we're not, that's not our role. We're there to give them confidence. And to give them the reassurance that actually they're doing a pretty damn good job here. You know, she's just birthed a baby and they're just adapting. So we try to encourage like the baby moon. Have you heard of the baby moon before? No. A bit like a honeymoon, you know, when you meet, well, in the good old days. <laughs> I don't know about good, but in the old days when you met someone, you got married and you went on the honeymoon to get to know them. I know it's a bit arse about face nowadays, but it's having that period together just to get to know each other. Because there's, again, hormones are at play and there's all this bonding process happening. Like some, not all babies that are born 
not, not, mummies, not all mummies fall in love immediately with their babies that are born. Sometimes it needs to be a bit of time. Just like we don't always fall in love with our partners in first sight. Sometimes you need a bit of time. So it's understanding that actually that's okay, you know, and how to, to help that, that process. So a bit of understanding, a bit of knowledge, um, how to make life easy, lots of practicalities, like if mum has had um, a cesarean, how to show her wee tips how to get out of the bed without pulling on herself, um, what to do with her scar if she has to sneeze or cough, um, the first pee and the first poo, oh my goodness, could go on forever. Things like that. And that's oh, the thing. This because, is an intricate process. <laughs> but that's the but that's the thing though. For for a lot of uh, mothers and then their partners, the partners are home for two weeks and then back to work. Yeah. So the mums even, is then yeah, and and the mums are just right. See you later. I'm away to work here. Yeah. And like, probably at the start, the first two weeks being at home, my head was fried because you obviously you've never experienced any of this before. So getting back to work, I was like. Know how to do this, uh, but but that's <laughs> true. <laughs> a break, you, yeah. But but that's true though. Yeah. You, you you wanted to get home to see your your newborn again, but getting away from the uh, that not chaos, but you know you know what I mean. Just all these things you didn't know it's anything constant, about, doesn't it? Yeah. It's constant. And you went to work and you were like, but the mum's still at home having to do all them things. And generally during the day, everybody's at work. All her friends are at work. She's left there by herself all day. Yeah. It's, it's a lonely time too. It is, and that's often around two to three weeks. I get the frantic calls, usually from the dad. And can you come and help us? You know, baby's waking up to the world. Um, we thought we had a wee routine, and baby's just crying all the time. You know, uh, we, we just need some help, need some support, need to get some sleep. We need, haven't eaten properly. I know. See, as a postnatal doula, I go around to mummy's homes, and it might be like two o'clock in the afternoon. Dad's back at work. I can assure you, she hasn't eaten a bite. I literally will pay to sleep tonight. Yeah. And I I know that sounds stupid, but just like, I'll be like, I don't care what I'm going to this week. Well, there are I'm some people who will. They get like nannies in or they get like doulas who do overnight, you know, just to to help with that. But, but this is the thing, you have to pay for the service, mm-hmm. which I find a wee bit difficult. There are some countries where the likes of myself, the government pay to go in like every day until baby six months. Popping in with the same family every day, maybe just for an hour, but just checking in. And that family knows that that woman's coming in every day. And if there's any issues that she can hopefully help them with, they'll be able to signpost them to someone who can help. But, you know, I the one thing I want to ask you, there's a lot of pressures on mum and, and like cultural pressures. Mm-hmm. So I remember when when the boys and breast is best. And I mean, to the point it was absolutely rammed down our throat. And I remember the time going, right, what is it? And as you start learning, yes, it is, okay. The the wonders that's in breast milk, when you start reading it and you start getting into it, it's unreal. But one thing that was in my mindset, and I was reading this, and how, how often mothers pair up with their child when the milk comes in or when the baby's latching. There's so much, it's an intricate process that, that not always happens that way, right? Mm-hmm. So... I was like, this, it, it is best, but the way it was being pushed, and I mean pushed, pushed by the nurse, the doctors and pamphlets and everything you looked at, I was like, what happens if for talk's sake, the milk doesn't come in straight away or the baby doesn't is tongue tie or there's something. The, 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 the mother is vulnerable enough for uh, postnatal and, and, yeah. and blues. The, the, the feeling of failure because it's being pushed and pushed and pushed. Nobody turns around and says, well, your baby will be fine if you have to give bottle. It's not, let's face it, we would rather. But it was unbelievable. And I actually was sitting thinking, I actually asked the nurse that day, I goes, what happens? There's a room, there was like 10 or 11 and there's a statistic like 3 in 10 or 30 or 40% doesn't take and it doesn't work and that's the a bottle fed or something like that, whatever it was. I remember reading and seeing it. And I was like, there's, there's about four mums here that's not going to be fit to do this, even if they want to do this. How are they going to feel if that doesn't happen? Like, you know, I I just thought it was, there's so much pressure on what you're supposed to do. Oh, you should do this naturally. And oh, you shouldn't take these and you shouldn't. But I think sometimes it just works out the way it's supposed to work out for. Obviously, if you have help and people that help you and people mm-hmm. that's there and, and, and can yeah. help you with that. And, 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 the one thing I was laughing at was I went to the class, the breastfeeding class, right? 
my boy was born sucking his thumb, so <laughs> I knew that boy was ready to rock and roll. But my wife, it was an emergency section. She was absolutely, I actually was popping him on and, and feeding him while she was KO'd. Mm-hmm. And I was like, if somebody's not there supporting her doing that, would that, she probably would have been fit. But is that a is that a role that you're there to help for for feeding and and thing? But do you, yeah. do you, do you see what I mean about some mums and and the pressure that that puts on them? Yeah, there's there's a lot. Um, there is a thing called breastfeeding grief, because and this usually just as you said, mums who'd planned to breastfeed and then something happens and there could be a hundred one different reasons that they don't, uh, and then they always like, well, beat themselves up about it, you know. So it's. It is, it is, you know, it could probably be a whole different podcast, really, um, mm. about breastfeeding and breastfeeding grief and the benefits and everything for it. Um, and again, Northern Ireland doesn't have great statistics for breastfeeding. But did you know, you do know that Ireland is the biggest exporter of milk for formula. <laughs> We're the largest export with the least numbers. <laughs> well, for formula milk, you say. But it it uh, look listen that was just one side of things and I was just th- I know th- yeah yeah but it, of of, of the, everyone has this idea what's idea was perfect and Instagram is some fucker for this because it's telling these mums what they should feel how they should be where they should be at and, and all these wee videos and everything's rosy and you, you go straight in and and everything's grand but it it it's it I always thought well pressure that comes with that and and everyone puts across this perfect image yeah. you know. They're all doing this picture going out the door. They're all doing these all pictures and thing, and the truth is, there's really not these all chaos. Over the place and, I know. And well, we know it's not real. We know a lot of Instagram isn't real. It's false, isn't it? But that's another thing that the doula would spend time talking to the family about. Like, let's talk about the actual realities here. What's your expectations? And a lot of couples will say, "Yeah, we'll have the baby, and hopefully, it'll be a good feeder and a good sleeper." You know, and. We might be out of sorts for a few days, but hopefully we'll be all right. And you have to sit down and just let's talk here about what, how you're actually going to feel. And actually, you probably don't know emotionally how you're going to feel, never mind physically. And then there's this whole period of adapting. So the baby's adapting. Baby was all lovely, perfectly tucked up in mommy's tummy, perfect temperature. No old nappies or baby grows to wear. Nobody fussing over it. Never felt hungry. Perfect, perfect um, no lighting. No reflux or colic? Nothing, nothing like that. And then all of a sudden, it's in this world. First thing somebody's doing is putting bands on its wrist, bands on its ankle, nappy on it, giving it a rub down. Um, and then it gets a breast stuck in its mouth or else a teat. And it's supposed to know just what to do, you know. So you have to think as well, it can be tough for the baby too, you know. And that's why some babies are really quite unsettled for a while because... They're just adapting. And then their wee bodies are still developing as well. They're they're going through massive brain development and they're going through massive developments inside. You talk about colic and reflux, and that's usually because the wee flap at the top of the esophagus isn't quite developed yet, you know. So there's a lot, you know, happening in there as well. So what does baby need again? Baby is safest environment is skin to skin. Skin to skin is amazing. I always say to my mummies and daddies, if you're having a really bad day with baby, just strip off and get into bed at three years. I'll bring you up some food later when you're dressed. <laughs> I can work magic. Just, you know, forget about everything. Turn the lights off. Play your favourite music. Play your birth and scripts. Baby will probably recognise them from whenever it's in the, in the womb. You can settle them down. Um, and just chill. Well, tell me, Instead for maybe the likes of expecting mothers, it's, you know, at the minute, how, how do you go and look about a doula? You know, do you go on Google and just search? And then how do you know who's the right fit for you as well? Like, how do you go through that process of finding a doula? Yeah, so usually people would go on to Google, go on to Google or there are registers to find a doula as well. Um, doula UK have like a find a register where you can put in your postcode and then any doulas in your area comes up. You put in either birth or postnatal, or you can put in both, whatever. Um, so you have a look at them, and they have a wee spiel about themselves. Like they call it wee doulography, and you read through it, and you think, oh, I am, okay, she's three grown-up kids. She's been doing this. Oh, I don't know if I like a look her. Let me move on. There's somebody else. Oh, I'll have a wee chat with her, and you just contact them, send them an email or call them. 
And so I always asked uh, to meet in person, usually somewhere, just meet somewhere like for a cup of somewhere because on neutral ground. Yeah. Um, and I always say if there's, you know, if dad's involved. Almost like dating them. It is a bit, it's a <laughs> bit like a date. And I says, you know, uh, you know, if if you're with your partner, you get them to come along too, because there's no point in the mum. Do you have I'm testimonials going. or like reviews? Yes, you, you uh, know. loads uh-huh. of them. Yeah. So it's really important because what I'm looking for at that first meeting as a connection, and we always know within the first couple of minutes if we like somebody or not. Yeah. Um, what about me and Sean? Would you come and do it for us? Only if you both have to have the baby at the same time. <laughs> 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 and oh, that's another thing. Do you have a conflict? Like, do you uh, do you take like one one client at a time? That's or a really two? good question. That's a really good question. As the question comes up in the doula training, um, I average um, like between twelve and fourteen a year. I couldn't cope with any more than that because. As my family say, whenever I'm on call, I'm in doula mode. <laughs> they say, Mum, you sort of go away and then you come back after the baby's born because I'm so focused on that wee family. Like I know when I'm sitting here, the wee family that I'm waiting on are probably being pestered about induction or something, you know, and I'm just thinking, please, God, wait, wait, wait. You know? And you're waiting on the wee message <laughs> well, coming hey, through to your watch. Yeah, and it's usually in the middle of the night, you know, usually I get tucked into bed and I get a wee call. Oh, things are happening. Yeah. Uh, it is, it's missed. But yes, back to you have to plan that out. Yeah. So I ideally, you know, I would not take any any more clients than that. But I also find it really hard to say no because I have a lot of return clients. Like I've been doing this for a yes, while and I have yes. mummies coming back to me for their second, third, fourth, fifth baby. Yeah. And there's no way I'm going to say no, I can't be your doula. Yeah. You know. Um, and actually, after this podcast, I'm going to visit a wee family in Cookstown. He, I was there. Hypnobirthing teacher, first time COVID wouldn't let me be the doula. So I was um, doula there for the last wee one that was born recently. Lovely. At home. So I'm going to have to visit right. them. So now, <laughs> I, that's something I forgot to ask. What about the pool jobs? Oh, the pools, yeah. So can I just back step a wee bit to doulas of NI? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this all started, you mentioned about how many clients taken on. As a doula with a bit of professionalism, I always would have um, like a backup just in case I ever became sick or something happened to me that I couldn't attend a birth, I would hate to let down anyone. So I started working with this girl, um, Sarah Benetti, but she's up in the North Coast and only were the two of us at the beginning working. So we formed a really good relationship. I would always be her backup, she would be mine. Um, and then we actually did shared care. So some couples, t- both of us, like for instance, when we were doula to triplets, a natural birth triplets, I thought it's going to take more than one doula here. So All hands on to, deck. Really was. <laughs> that was amazing. Like first baby was born in water. Can you imagine? And the next two um, breach. Oh, it was amazing. Anyway, um, I get full of oxytocin when I think about we it. Triplets were born in water. One well, first one was born in water. Yeah, oh. it was amazing. Yeah, three boys. Why does three little ducks come into my head? <laughs> <laughs> three boys. Yeah, there'll be four. So, the four now. Um, so yeah, so we obviously got really close with um, our doula work. Um, so then we started the doulas of NI because we thought, you know, we're doing all this together anyway. Just let's put ourselves out there, doulas NI, uh, as a collective. And then um, we had Tara, Tara Thompson Belfast. She's a yoga teacher and she started doing backup for us as well. And we thought, oh, we like her, like get her to join. Yeah, so the three of us now, we have this wee collective and it means we can bring all our different skills and talents together and provide a really individualised service for some couples, you know. So we offer different packages, you know, we do the hypnobirthing package, the doula package, the postnatal yoga, whatever. You know, we do like three-step rewind, you know, this is where if someone has a bit of trauma from birth, they can go through this process to be able to view their birth without feeling traumatised. So Tara and Sarah do that. And we do things like biomechanics, which is like moving the body. You know, we we hear things of baby getting stuck or baby is in an awkward position. We can actually help uh, work with mum and her body to get baby into the optimal position for birth or even during during labour and birth as well. Um, We, what else do we do? I can't think at the minute, but I do like mother ceremonies as well, mother blessings. So people are preparing for the for the baby. Um, it's all the women and her family coming together to prepare her for labour and stuff. So it's, it's lovely. I mean, the work's beautiful. So we all got together with a collective and we also all had our own pools for home births. 
so we decided then we got all these new pools and we hire them out. So any money that we make from hiring them out goes to a charity to support women who can't afford doulas or women who want to have a much better birthing experience. So we hire out pools, we hire out TENS machines. Have you heard of the TENS machines? Yeah. yeah. Um, I do we um, cord ties for the cords. We inbiggle tor- cords instead of the clamps. Uh, I've got a birth sling that I got imported from Australia and we have peanut balls and cubs. So cubs and inflatable birth and still. So we have all this that we would hire out all over the province to say, you know, one of your family got one last week. So it's really well, exciting. <laughs> that, so obviously families that have researched this and elected for a home water birth. Yeah. The, well, did they generally have a midwife there or not or... Yeah, yeah. So they would have the community midwives or the home birth team. Some trusts, well, the Southern Trust have a dedicated home birth team. Um, but yes, it's usually the community midwives would be on call for home births. So, but it's up to the parents to organise the the birth pool and stuff. And then you get the pool. Like I just, it, you know, I was like that never entered my psyche because I was like, shit. There's a, a lot of moving parts going on here as, as it is. I, I don't need a lazy spa in the middle of the, the front room and, and, <laughs> and, 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 and I not know what to do. I'm, I'm only joking. But yeah. it uh, it's obviously somebody that's that uh, well read and they've researched it and they've made this conscious decision. So are they easier worked with or harder worked with when when they they feel that they're well read? Like Because I, I sometimes I get the impression of like, and this Sorry to sound this and and to any of you that have had a home birth and all, uh, this is probably stereotypical. I get this more like more like happy vibe where they have this idea, but I just feel like sometimes like birth is like a spanner that just comes flying in the works. Like you're 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 making this when you're sitting here and it's good, and then all of a sudden you're like shit. <laughs> did I? You know, you, you get that moment of like, did I make the right idea? You know, you need to be very strong in your conviction that this is what we're doing because you can't decide halfway, you know, in the pool where we're heading into the hospital now. Well, I think knowledge is power, you know, and some people look into it and they look at the reason and why people choose the undisturbed like home birth, you know, and they can see that's going to be more beneficial to them and the baby. Uh, and usually babies that are born in the water usually are so calm and gentle as well because they're swimming from one fluid into another, you know, Um like kitten birth and babies are always so calm and chilled as well. I hope your babies boys are too. <laughs> oh, I my mine are as calm yeah. as they come. Yeah, they, uh, they, they look amazing. like two Tasmanian devils at the bounce cleaning <laughs> the wall. They don't go through door or they don't open doors. They go through them. But yeah. that's maybe more uh, nature over nurture. That <laughs> I think it's probably a combination of both. You know, and you know there is a, there's a lot of research has been done into it's called photology studies. There's been a lot of research done into how babies come into the world and how it affects their personality, their character, how it um, affects even their behaviour as well, um, which well, is quite interesting. <laughs> There's a whole lot of other you know, podcasts. Yeah. There, but there is so many elements and so many different, like very specialised. And I know sometimes you're sitting there and you're like, look, listen, this is what I do. I, I can mm-hmm. talk about what I do. But you have a general over... You have 110 babies in, in, in the, on the book. You know, like you, yeah. you know, you, you've... Not that everyone you've experienced every type, but you, you're well aware of the different things that have happened. It, to me, the weirdest thing, and we were going to do this, and I was like, is this weird that two men have the podcast <laughs> with it? But also, we've been through separate journeys, and mm-hmm. and and we we you know we both we both have had our experiences with it, and it it's something that I find that I'm hoping men would listen to this and be like. Well, I was thinking the same. How's this happen? How's that happen? And where do I stand in this? And you know, my granddad had a better way of it. He was in the pub and he got a phone call and he had an hour pint. Like you know, it, it, it it's not times of change, which I'm I'm glad and I'm glad I was present and and, and fit yeah. to help. And but uh, it's such a complex. You could do a pod in different sections mm-hmm, on it. Mm-hmm. It's such a complex thing, and hopefully we've given an overview for some of the, the gays and and mm-hmm. young couples out there that, and hopefully also then that we've people that were panicking that don't have the network of support like because the the, the amount of people we're having smaller families now yeah. there, there's less there's less uh children per household now than there, there there ever was like in years so like the 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 population per birth rate's going down not the actual amount of yeah. children but per per yeah. household so 
that network of support gets smaller as, as time goes by. So hopefully for anyone out there that maybe they want to have a child, maybe they're, they're put off the idea because they don't know. And there's just generally people don't know anything about the children and have actually a fear, oh, Jesus, don't leave me with that child. I don't I don't know what to do. Yeah. So hopefully for anyone out there that, that, that didn't have the network support, there is options out there. There's doulas out there. There's people that will yeah. come and support you in the in between stages where you can you can learn your hypnobirthing. You can you can have a a, a backup a partner in there for when when you yeah. you're giving birth, and you can have somebody to come afterwards and 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 watch how you're changing up, watch how you're feeding and how you're holding happen, and, yeah. and reassure you. Yeah. So hopefully now people reach out and and uh, they they. Uh, they get they they get help or they see the option that that's, that's there. And the thing with the postnatal doula, I should actually say this: whenever I take on a postnatal job, we never know like how many hours you know someone wants me for. Because I have people say, "Oh, well, I want you for a hundred hours." I'm like, "Let's cut that down a wee bit because you don't know how you're going to feel after a couple of you might you might not need me after a couple of weeks." And they're like, oh, "We will, we will, we will." I'm thinking, well, actually, if I'm doing my job really well, you won't need me because it's like. You're getting a job, but you don't want a job, okay? So you're employing a postnatal doula, but when they turn around you and I look at them and think, you don't need me anymore. I know that's a job well done, but it's almost as if I'm doing myself out of a job. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But then I think, that's, that's, that's I feel good then because I know I've given them the skills and the confidence like to cope with this newborn period. But they'll always know if they need me, I'll be there, but they don't have to be paying a fortune, you know? Well, my boy's... To my youngest, and I would definitely pay something. <laughs> 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 well, no, but I get what you're saying. It's yeah. to allow them to stand their own two feet, absolutely, and yeah. and and also then it allows you then to help the next family. You know, mm-hmm. if if they are, or if some people just require that bit more reassurance, maybe not need any more help, but just need to be told that what they're doing is right. Yeah. To have that there would make the world a difference. But uh, look, I've enjoyed it. It's it's. I, it's a learning thing. I still struggle to see how the most natural process in the world is shrouded in so many questions. And like, so much fear. Yeah. It's a fear. I've never like, used to add about home births and that. If you think, if you go back in generations, I don't know if you were born at home or your your mum or her mum or that. See it's not my, that long ago. You see the size of my head? She was. She ain't taking no chances at home with this. <laughs> <laughs> I grinned it. Women, <laughs> women's bodies are amazing. We will not very, very rarely grow a baby that we can't birth. I literally, I'm going to say this to you, right? Have you ever rocked up, locked in, and goes, "We you delivered that." I, I actually genuinely one time seen this baby, and it was a tank, right? <laughs> And the mummy was the slightest thing. And I was like, section? No. Fair <laughs> play. Just see babies are brilliant. Fair play. <laughs> look, and she's like, oh my God, man. They have no idea. <laughs> no idea. <laughs> but look, listen. And, and, trust the process. Trust yeah. the woman and trust the baby. They know what to do. Uh, well, look, listen. It, uh, We've learned a lot in this podcast, I think. <laughs> I keep on. I, I don't know why my head's going back to the whole birthing process and tweaking nipples and stuff, but that's where my head's oh, at. I know what I should have said to you as well. Maybe I should. Oh well. Go for it. But never hold it's down. It's in your head. Are you sure? If the shit I come out with, yours will never look bad compared to mine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Floppy face, floppy fanny. What? <laughs> what is that? A floppy face and floppy mummy. <laughs> We're talking about the birth process. If you yeah. keep the jaw relaxed, floppy face, the cervix relaxes. Ah, if you keep right. tension here, the baby, on your cervix will never dilate. And Here's a gem note. for you. On that note, but look, <laughs> look your wife dead in the eyes and say, baby, floppy face, floppy funny. <laughs> <laughs> work wonders. <laughs> Don't be uh, clapping that bit either. <laughs> but you know what? It uh, it it's a con- it's we often find, and this is lighthearted because you know what? It's actually one of the most special things in the world, and it and is. the bring baby into the world is a magical, magical thing. It's absolute carnage sometimes, but it it's nice because we're saying it's smiling because at the end of it, and and hopefully always at the end of it yeah. and we've had podcasts on baby loss so we're, we're we're not naive to it and some people will be saying oh yeah you're just talking about that 
we've covered that side of pregnancy and loss in another one so we it, this one was about the joy and the, and and the love yeah. and and the things so we got to say that in a in a smiley face while we're joking about some of the things and while me and Sean still like <laughs> a lot of things the one thing i will always say women there's some there are some tool because if it was up to us we couldn't do it and the other thing that i always said was a single mum I the respect you have for a woman that does that on her own absolutely yeah. mm-hmm. unbelievable mm-hmm. but thank you so much for coming up I, I had a ball I, I I you know you know what when we were reading through the 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 info and the and hypno birth and the thing and I was like and back there I was like I've done that and everyone stopped and goes <laughs> what but uh, I think that uh, even for people that aren't as holistic uh, and I'm not I think you need to look into it and if if your partner is don't be ignorant to it don't cut her off and don't think because if if anything helps it helps and and yeah. and that's the only thing i would say to that definitely to me i don't get it but it was a massive help to my wife so i'm glad i did do it and i'm glad we had you all thank you very much thank oh. you very much Anne. oh thank you that was super thank you <laughs>